The focus on my channel for the past five years has been the evolution of tools through history, starting with the Stone Age with the ultimate goal of reaching the steam engine. The steam engine marked a turning point, the industrial revolution, when everything accelerated thanks to this massive force multiplier. A single engine could do the work of many. But what I find fascinating is exploring a historical what if. What if the competitor to the steam engine had arisen first. In this video, we're exploring the first practical electric engine and asking, could it have been an alternative catalyst to the industrial revolution? A fascinating thing about the development of electricity is that in theory, it could have been discovered and developed much earlier. The factors that led to the development when it did were very specific, but with a few changes, it's not hard to imagine an earlier timeline. The earliest exploration of static electricity began with the ancient Greeks around 600 BCE. But then progress largely stagnated until the 1600s. From there, it took about 200 years of experimentation before things really took off in the 1800s. One possible exception is the so-called Baghdad battery, dating to around the year 200. These were ceramic jars that resembled galvanic cells and might have produced a small electric charge. Most scholars believe they were likely just used to store scrolls or other materials, but out of curiosity, I previously built and tested one, and it did produce a small but real electric charge. The result is so small it's hard to imagine much practical use for it at the time, but if this discovery had sparked further curiosity, it's possible to imagine a world where electricity was studied and harnessed centuries earlier. The main technological challenges for early electronics involved extracting and working with three different metals, copper, iron, and zinc, and the ability to pull metal into a wire. Copper and iron were both mastered early on, with the Iron Age officially starting in 1200 BCE, with the concept of wire making dating even earlier, first primarily for making jewelry and then chain Mail, its practice would only get better and more refined in the Middle Ages. Probably the biggest limiting factor I can think of is the extraction of the metal zinc. Most early batteries were dependent on this metal, not formally known to Europeans until 1746. However, Indian metallurgists were supposedly producing metallic zinc as early as the 12th century, and there's some evidence with relics dating as early as the 1st century. So in my view, the biggest thing holding back electric engines from predating the steam engine wasn't technology, but the social and intellectual forces that spurred experimentation. The scientific revolution and the rise of scientific societies that created just the right environment. In our timeline, the first electric motor was built by Michael Faraday in 1821, but is more of a conceptual demonstration than a practical device. The first electric engine capable of doing real work came in 1834 with Jacobi's motor. A later version was even powerful enough to propel a boat carrying 14 people. The steam engine came about 100 years earlier, first in 1712 and then massively improved in 1769. Although the first steam engine was technically made in the first century with the aliopile. Something I explored last year in a similar what if scenario, trying to see if the steam engine could have been started earlier. Here we get home, open the fridge and realize the only meat that you got is a little questionable. That was me until I tried Good Chop. Now my freezer is stocked with American sourced high quality meat and seafood. Like the free range organic chicken, wild caught salmon, and my new favorite, their steaks. I love that everything showed up vacuum sealed and frozen at peak freshness. So I cook when I want, not when the grocery store tells me to. And here's the best part, it all comes from US farms and fisheries. You're supporting local producers and the taste seriously shows. That chicken, juicy and flavorful, not the bland stuff you used to get at the store. If you wanna skip the guesswork and get better meat, go to goodchop.com YouTube and use code HTME50 for $50 off plus free shipping off your first box. Again, that's goodchop.com YouTube, code HTME50. High quality food without the hassle. In the evolution of electricity, the first stages were mostly parlor tricks and curiosities. But once the nature of electricity was better understood, inventors quickly sought ways to put it to use. One of the first was inspired by the realization that electricity could travel almost instantly through wires, leading to the idea of sending messages over long distances using a telegraph. We explored this last year with our own telegraph. A few methods were first explored, but eventually it was discovered the ability to use electricity to form an electromagnet, which caused an armature to tap, allowed coded messages to be sent very quickly. The discovery of the electromagnet in 1825 was a huge deal and a gateway for converting electrical energy into physical motion. It was discovered that electricity and magnetism are closely connected. When electric current flows through a wire, it produces a magnetic field around it called electromagnetism. If you coil the wire, those electric fields stack up and reinforce each other, making a stronger field. Put a metal core like iron inside that coil and the magnetic field gets amplified even more, creating a strong temporary magnet, which stops as soon as the current is disconnected. 
reverse the flow of electricity, and the magnet is formed in the reverse polarity. The turning off and on of an electromagnet allows you to use electricity to move a physical object through magnetism. But could you use this force to make an engine that could do significant work? Yes, but it took a bit to figure out. First up, let's forge out a set of eight nearly identical iron horseshoes for use for our electromagnets. Next, we'll need our wire. Previously, we spent a whole video exploring the process of turning a block of copper into a thin wire. So we'll start this time with a spool of our own wire, which we'll need to insulate so that our electromagnet doesn't short itself out. For insulation, we use a formula by Edison using asphaltium, linseed oil, and beeswax. The basic idea for the motor is to have two circular arrays of electromagnets, a stationary one called the stator and a rotating one called the rotor. By alternating the polarity of the current, magnets can attract or repel each other, causing the rotor to spin towards the next set of magnets. By then swapping their polarity, you can make the rotor spin once again to the next set of magnets. If you can achieve this in the correctly timed sequence, the rotor will spin continuously. Achieving this was done through the invention of the commutator, a component that reverses the current direction at the right moment as the rotor spins. When timed correctly, this keeps the rotor continuously pulling towards the next coil in sequence. Put all together and you've got a self-sustaining spinning motor, as long as you supply an electric current. So this is the progress so far on the electric motor. We managed to get it up and spinning, which is fantastic. Still a lot of improvements to go though. Obviously we've got a whole kind of rat's nest of wiring going on, so we're gonna kind of dial that in. The biggest thing we've done since we checked in last time was I added some reinforcement plates to the uh, rotor here. Um, to help with play in this direction, which has been a huge improvement. And then we improved the commutator as well to be a four-piece commutator instead of two-piece. The idea being, instead of us having a magnet that's off, on, off, on, we now have an alternating magnet that's uh, alternating polarity as it spins around. It's even got some good torque behind it, um, but I think the biggest thing we can do now to improve it is dial in the uh, gap between each one of these magnets. You can see here, some of them are over a centimeter in gap, which is no bueno. Some of our poles on top here are within millimeters of each other. So if we can dial it in so that all of these are about this width apart, I think we'll have drastic improvements in the efficiency. But so far, so good. I'd have to say I'm pretty impressed with the results from this. This is definitely an engine that hacks at least some power. I was even able to use it to displace water, took it out to a lake, and actually was able to propel the boat. Not very fast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Here he goes. Bye. I think we need two of them. <laughs> it moved the boat. I think that counts. Fine. <laughs>
Yeah, it kind of Ultimately, that's the main issue with this engine is that the batteries are not very efficient. It takes a lot of power to push this thing. And they ended up doing 320 Daniel cell batteries to power this to get it to uh, propel a boat. And even then they couldn't even reach much faster than three miles per hour. In the end, this was kind of considered a failure at the time. So I think inevitably we can compare this engine to the steam engine. That if it had come more contemporarily with the invention of the steam engine, that I think it would be a lot more comparable. Because the efficiency of this, and I've only done some basic estimates that it's probably maybe 10% efficiency, which is not good for electric motor, but compared to the very first steam engine, this is so much more efficient. I think with some more tweaks and improvements, we could start using this in the workshop for some actual tools. So I'm hoping to find a better way to get a more accurate measurement of how efficient it is, but I think it's already multiple times better than the first and even the more improved watt steam engine. So as I said, the biggest limitation for this is the battery power and a lot of batteries at this time were not very strong. I've, we've built some really massive arrays and a few different arrangements of very similar voltaic batteries. And we've been able to get a, a notable amount of power, but uh, not very comparable to anything modern today. Ironically, the most powerful battery I've made was actually one of the first ones I made, lead acid. And these I made pretty early on in a video where I was trying to explore the Dr. Stone generator that they built. Ultimately, that was horribly inefficient. I think even if I had gotten it working perfectly, it still would not be possible to actually charge these batteries. And that's kind of the, the main issue with these batteries is that they can hold a tremendous amount of power, but initially they don't really have a charge. So you'll have to use a generator of some sort to put power into this. And that kind of leads into where we're gonna go next. With a lot of electronic things, they're reversible. And technically, this machine could be run in reverse to generate power, but it's not very powerful. So in an upcoming project, we're gonna build a recreation of one of the first industrial generators that were able to provide power in the first days of electricity. And for that, the principle is gonna be very similar to this, except kind of just amplified. It's gonna be optimized in a lot of ways and allow us to generate a lot more power than this thing. It's gonna require almost a mile of wire coiled around the device. If it works out, it itself is gonna generate a lot of power. But perhaps more importantly, we can charge up these batteries fully and I already have an array of 12 of these, which makes it almost to the same power as a car battery. It's gonna open the door for a lot of new technologies. So once again, this year, I'm gonna be at open source, and our plan is to bring this machine with us. I'm gonna bring the more powerful generator and set it up so people can crank it themselves and generate some actual power. Might set it up so you can charge your phone or power something, and I'm hoping I can see some of you there. Thank you to all my supporters on Patreon. Without you, this won't be possible. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.